bit that I have to, uh, that I forgot to thank the sponsors again. So, <laughs> uh, thanks to our sponsors, ClearTrip, WebEngage, and Music Guru. Um, sorry, I forgot. Um, and I also wanted to say that it's absolutely coincidental that all the talks feature ClearTrip and Zomato very prominently as examples of good design. There's no, we didn't tell speakers to put those in at all. Of course, we would never do that. Um, and the, uh, yeah. So th um, the next talk is um, by Shamila, who works at Amazon on user experience. And she's going to be talking about mobile accessibility. So yesterday we had uh, Prem, who, was, who gave us a beginner's introduction or an introduction to accessibility, what it is, how you can look at it. And you also had some demos about uh, screen readers, how they work, different assistive technology. So Shamila is going to go into some depth about how you can solve the same problems, but on a much smaller factor the uh, technical challenges that are introduced as well as the opportunities. Good afternoon. Shamna, this side. How are you doing? Good. Hungry? I'm sure. I'm hungry. <laughs> okay. So my talk is on mobile accessibility challenges and best practices. So before going to that, uh, the disclaimer is Uh, there are a lot of principles and guidelines for mobile accessibility, but I won't be covering all of them due to the lack of time. So I'll be covering only a couple of them which I felt is important. So if you feel like the ones which I uh, am showcasing are not the important ones, we can take it offline and we can talk about it. And the second, th uh, second thing is, yesterday Prem spoke about accessibility already. So there may be some slight repetitions uh, in my talk as well. So I apologize for that in advance. Uh, because accessibility is the same. The term is same, uh, principles are same, the only thing is device changes and challenges increases. So now, do we really need to care about mobile? Yes, no. Yes, why? Uh -huh. Because you have one? <laughs> Great. <laughs> sure. Yes, we need to care about it. Because it has become an integral part of our life. Everyone uses it everywhere, every time, you know. So it is very much important. At the same time, it is important for them as well. Agree? Disagree? Agree? I don't hear any yes or no. Yes. Yeah. So are we not being biased when we are developing something or some mobile applications? We are. Aren't we? Yeah. But <coughs> the big point here is mobile by definition is disabling. Confused? How do I say that? Sure. Do you remember this? One of the oldest phone. How many people used to have this phone? Oh man, so many people. <laughs> Great. So basically this is an electronic telecommunication device. So mobile, mobile basically was and is supposed to be an electronic telecommunication device. The purpose basically is to make and receive calls and then send and receive messages. That is what a mobile device was basically meant for. Right? So that is the reason it have small screen, poor light, small fonts. So these are some of the things which makes it disabling. Agree? Yes? Now, at the same time, mobile is by definition enabling. Any idea why this? And what is that? <laughs> Okay, so the thing is mobile have, you know, the definition of mobile has changed from what it used to be to what it is now. 
So a lot of things have changed. People started expecting more from it. So rather than just being a calling device or messaging device, it has changed. It added so many new features. People want more from the devices. So then a lot of new features have been you know, introduced like geolocation, camera, calendar. All these things makes it enabling. And then again, I can't afford a computer, but I have a mobile. I'm not talking about the smartphones, of course. Right? Not everyone can afford the smartphones, but basic phones they can. And basic phones can also have the same kind of features, functionalities, applications which we develop for smartphones. Right? Now the next big question is, what are the different types of applications? Can anyone tell this? I can't hear. Native? Okay. Okay, that is not application type. They are a category. I mean, there are different categories of application which are talking about. Application types basically are, as you mentioned, native applications, which basically is device specific, iOS, Android, which you have to download from the respective marketplaces. And then you have uh, mobile applications, which is the HTML based application, which works on your mobile browser. And then you have something called hybrid application, which is a combination of mobile application, which is when you, you know, combine the uh, features of uh, mobile and native, that is what is called an hybrid application. And then you again have a responsive application. So these are the four different types of applications. Now the next big question is, we have so many devices, we have so many different types of you know, uh, mobile applications to build. How do I make my application accessible? So before even getting into how, I should know what exactly is accessibility. Yesterday Prem spoke about accessibility, but what do you understand by accessibility? I'm sure you guys was not concentrating on yesterday's talk. <laughs> no one is ready to give a definition? Okay. Making so, sure that the uh, the largest section of the population uh, is can access all the content on your screen, which will be on a computer or now on a mobile. Yeah. So basically, accessibility to me is making an application accessible and usable for everyone, irrespective of age, ability, and situations. Right? And how do I call this for a mobile application? For a mobile application, I call it accessible when it is ready for the diverse user model. Like you have sight problem, hearing problem, cognition, assistive technologies. When your site is ready for assistive technologies like screen readers, that is when it is accessible. Hidden disabilities. What is this? Depression, chronic and these things. Then you have aging. This is also important. The way I use a computer or a mobile, my parents will not be able to use it, right? Generation gap. Or maybe when I grow old, I don't know how my son would be using it and how I would be using it, right? And then you have something called temporary fractures, accidents. These are also kind of disabilities. That is, that is not, <laughs> see, low, low bandwidth definitely is a kind of accessibility, but that is, Situational, that is not functional, right? Then you have cultural. This is also one of the things. And then technology and challenges, that is where your low bandwidth comes. Technology changes, operating system keeps changing, so many upgrades come, so many different devices come, so many new things are coming up. How do I make it accessible? This is what, when you are ready for all these things, that is when your mobile application is accessible. Now, what are the challenges? Anyone? Yeah? Sure. Uh, you're, talking about different, uh, you're talking about the different accessibility issues, and as a part of that, you bought out things that were not uh, generally considered or I haven't thought in uh, depression being a, uh, an issue in terms of accessibility. Mm -hmm. I know it's very prevalent but uh, I can't correlate what is the accessibility issue that it brings or what is the restrictiveness. Because when you are depressed 
your brain stops working to some extent. You're not, you know, completely concentrating of couple, on couple of things. Let's say you're depressed, you have some tension in your mind, and you have to, you know, do some banking transaction or something. You may get confused, you may make mistakes. So that is again a kind of, you know, a challenge for you, a disability, okay. right? Sure, yeah, thanks. So now, uh, what are the different type of challenges? Anyone? Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happened? Everyone is talking about bandwidth. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. So first thing is small device. So obviously this covers the screen size. The second thing is your mobile comes in all different shapes and sizes. Right? So that is the biggest challenge. I have the smallest pho mobile phone, I have the biggest tablet, I have so many things to you know cover, so many things to make sure like okay my application is accessible for. And then you have touch screens. That is the biggest challenge. And you have lack of standardized UI. Why? You have jQuery mobile, you have Sencha, you have the native applications, you have hybrid applications. So many different kind of applications are there, so many programming languages are there which we have to use. So you know that makes it very much difficult for us to concentrate on the accessibility. And then lack of device expandability, right? Memory is limited, you can't upgrade it to a huge amount, it can be to some extent. So those kind of challenges. And then obviously you don't know what context you'll be using your mobile device on. So context could be something different. Now, with all these challenges, how do I make my mobile application accessible? I would say, before even getting into the thought of the standards and guidelines, accessibility should be in your mind. It should be in your decision making process. You should first think like, okay, I have to make things accessible. It's not just because, you know, it's a mandate in some countries, I have to make it. That is the reason only government sites are accessible. Not all applications. So it should be in your decision-making decision, decision -making process, it should be in your mind before even thinking about the standards. Now coming to the ingredients. Am I going fast? Okay. So the ingredients are web standards, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, XML, which is basically used for uh, mobile web applications. And then you have uh, web browsers, which again works on the mobile web. Uh, mobile web. Then you have platform accessibility APIs. So this is basically, you know, platform specific APIs, which is available for device like iOS, Android, Blackberry, and so on. And then you have assistive technologies, screen readers, right? Then you have platform accessibility features. So all the devices have their own inbuilt accessibility features like iOS have something called voiceover. So when someone is touching, it will voice over for disabled people who can't hear or who can't, who can't see, sorry. So, and the biggest is users. Without them, we don't even need the terms like accessibility, usability, user experience, or we don't need these standards. Now coming to the principles. First is, add descriptive text to your user interface controls. So this is the same thing which, ha which we have been doing for a web as well, we need alternate text. But why do we need it? Why? So that? As in? Okay. So he's losing that content. So, yeah, that's it. The screen readers can read the uh, content in case the images are not loaded. Right here. Right here. Right. The screen readers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the screen readers, in case the images are not loaded, can at least read the content of. Uh huh. Having the alt tags would help for that. Yeah, definitely. So the challenge is not all users can read the information if we have it in the form of images, objects and uh, you know dynamic stuff. So that is the reason 
all these things should have an alternate and descriptive text. Who does it help? It helps the people who are blind. It covers the uh, functional disabilities, right? It helps the people who use assistive technologies. At the same time, it helps the functional disabilities like, uh, sorry, situational disabilities like uh, some people turn off their images in the mobile because you know for downloading the images also you, your data usage is there so you may be charged and then some of the browsers they don't support the size so it can shrunk and a lot of problem happens. Now how do we do this? So we basically do alt in the HTML, right? And in Android, we use something called content description and then we add the string. When we are doing something for HTML, it is like you have to do it in the element specific. You have image, you have to do it. For Ahref, you are writing title, which is an alternate text and so on. But for Android, it's more like you have to write Android colon content description and you have to write it for all the things like image or whatever you want. How do I do it in iOS? In the interface builder itself, I have something called accessibility. When I click and enable this thing, then it gives me label hints and triads where I can write what label, what triad and all. So I'll explain you what exactly this is. Label is basically your alternate text. What do you want? And the triad is basically, is it a button? Is it an image? What is it? Right? And hint is basically, hint is optional. It's not mandatory. Hint is basically used to uh, tell like, okay, this is a button, uh, it goes back or something like that. This is an example which I gave. This is a video player, which is a combination of multiple images and so on. So the label here, if you see for the pause and play, the but try it is button. And the same thing if you go on the right hand side, I have a label which is show more and the try it is button again. So this is how we define it in iOS. The guideline here is localize the text, add information which is contextual. So if this is a button, what button uh, it is and what it is trying to do, you have to mention that just because you know, I've seen people doing this. They actually link this thing to search engine optimization and do a lot of keyword stuffing. I've seen that. So, <laughs> Don't do that because that is not accessibility. You're trying to, you know, use accessibility for search engine optimization. Okay. Now, second thing is don't rely on colors alone to convey meaning. I'm sure everyone is able to see this image. What do you understand by, by with, uh, you know, by this green and uh, red? Can you see? What is that? In that four options, you are asking the user to use the last option. <laughs> okay. No, so what do you understand with these colors? The red and green. Uh, red is danger, green is okay. <laughs> okay. This looks like a button to you? Exactly. The text is not visible first of all. And this looks more like a button. So when I first opened this application, I was trying to click and see like, okay, what will happen? But that is a static text. So the thing is, why shouldn't we rely on color alone? We saw a live example, danger, right? Not everyone perceives the color properly. Everyone have their own way of understanding the colors. This again has some cultural differences also, which is included. So definitely we have to take care of this thing. This helps the blind people and colorblind people who can partially or cannot perceive color at all. And then it helps people who, I mean some of the mobile devices, they have limited color palettes and then some of the screen readers, they have limited color palettes and all. So for them also it is useful because they won't be able to completely depend on colors. And then when you go out, how many times it happens, like, are you able to see your device properly? Because I find a lot of difficulty, you know, when I'm trying to access my mobile outside, I have to put my hand like this and then see, like, okay, I have to give it some shade. 
So, that again is a kind of disability, right? Why is it happening? Because of the poor color combinations which we have. So, fortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> I've used Jomato too. <laughs> Yeah, so the thing is use blocks of color rather than vague outlines and shades. The contrast, the, for, the background and foreground contrast should be uh, 4.5 is to 1, 7 is to 1. So, we have couple of online checking tools which we can use and see how better our application is contrasting the colors and all. We can do that. But before even getting into like what 4.5 is to 1 or A is, uh, let me tell you the contrast is very important not only for disabled people but also for people who can see properly. So now you have this 4.5 is to 1 which compensates for people who have low visual acuity and then lot of contrast sensitivity. These are also kind of you know accessibility issues and uh, you have 7 is to 1 for people with uh, vision loss or 2080 kind of things. Background and background? Yeah, the contrast is basically background and foreground. So, background like if it is 4.1, the foreground should be 7 or something. This is the minimum requirement. Okay, and how do you measure these numbers? So, you have online tools. So, basically, all these colors are RGB values, right? You have uh, hash, CCC, hash, FFF, and so on. So, there are online tools, the contrast checker tools available online. So, where you can put both the images, both the color uh, RGB values and then you can check. So, it will give you like okay with this combination. So, example, when I checked this image, the black and red and white and uh, red, when I checked in the color tool, it was giving me 21.7 or something, which is the highest contrast, which is the best contrast, which we have. So, you can check like okay, this is the background color, this is the foreground color. That is how we check it. Yeah? I would like to add, you know, foreground, background not only apply to uh, background and foreground per se, but also maybe in a button. The button has yeah. a background and the text has yeah, a text Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's so contrast it's, for it's everything. It's multi-level. Yeah. For yeah. all the interface uh, things, yeah. it works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Like I have a question regarding for different mobiles the screens quality will be different. So we are measuring this uh, contrast ratio in the sense that it is how it will be perceived by the pro graphics processor, right? But the how you see it is different. For instance, some screens may be having a good contrast ratio, so it may be showing like that. Yeah. So even if you match the 4.5 is to 1 ratio, some screens may not be showing it like that, right? So that is the reason this this has been tested and. For a mobile device, minimum 4.5 is to 1 is what works for any mobile for the contrast. So, that is what uh, the W3C actually suggests. So, they have tested it like, okay, what is the contrast which works for a mobile? Yeah. What about the relative of colors? For instance, yellow is normally considered a brighter color than, say, a red or a blue. Uh, but the RGB value is not very different. It's just F on one side, on one column versus the other. So, does it co do these contrast checking tools also look at human perception of colors? No. Mm? It is just about yeah. the RGB values. Yeah, that's it. <coughs> uh, wouldn't that be a bit of a limitation? What uh, is that? Wouldn't that be a bit of a limitation? For instance, blue at the maximum is still very, very low contrast to black compared to say yellow. So, basically is. how contrast works. So, there is something called hue, there is something called, uh, uh, you know, values. Right? So, what is hue? Hue is color of color. So, you have red, green, blue, you have all these things, these are hues. You have values which is like uh, basically there can be different shades of red, there can be different shades of blue and all. So, when value, one value is combined with another, that is when you get the best combination. So, hues may not work always. So, so, there are different things that is how you can check whether it is working or not. The color checker basically is to check like what is the contrast which you are using and it will give you a percent. So, it is more like you know when you are checking for accessibility. So, it will tell you okay these are the accessibility problem in your site. Right? I have a question here, here, back. Okay. Uh, we recently built an application so, but we did not uh, give a serious thought about accessibility. So, towards the end we we thought okay, okay, that's important. So we uh, did this color contrast checking also. So what we found out, found out was we used some contrasting colors before. Our visual designer did the design 
it was aesthetically very pleasing and all. But finally, when we uh, came to the accessibility uh, section or mm, uh, the process in which we made the application accessible, mm -hmm. we had to actually compromise on some colors. So that again, uh, we had to consult our visual designer. So don't you, don't you think that we should start right from the scratch? I mean, at least when we start building the layouts, when the visual designers designer does the mock-up, would, wouldn't that be nice for the, when actually these things is also actually imported into the visual designer so that he can actually think? I, I know that it's a bit limiting from a creativity point of view, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So that is how it is. When, when you are designing something, accessibility should be taken in uh, consideration right from the beginning. So visual designers should be aware of all these, you know, contrasts. Because I've seen, I'm a designer basically. So I know how, you know, we design things. Right? So definitely that is important. And then the color guidelines basically are, make sure you have a proper contrast. And also make sure like whatever you're trying to show on your mobile application with color is also available without colors. The next is minimize text input in the interface. Do we need it? Yes, no? Text input. Text input. It can be anything. Text also. It, it adds to text input, text, text. I'm writing something, Facebook. I'm typing my message. That is also a kind of input. Right? Agree, disagree? How many people face problem with this typing? Very few people. Wow. I'll give you an example. I mean, recent incident which happened with me. Two days back, uh, blast happened in Hyderabad. So, I actually wanted to send a message on the Facebook and I wrote, uh, I was traveling actually, I was in the car and I was, I was writing like, okay, hope all my Hyderabad friends are safe. It's so disheartening to see such incidents happening in India, right? And then I posted it, but due to, you know, the jerks, travel, whatever, I don't know uh, what message went because I didn't actually bother to check. The way, we, you know, we don't see the URLs on the top, the same way I just posted it. After some time, I got the comment on that, like one word can make you sound evil. So I thought, what is my friend trying to say? And then I reread my uh, message and it read like, hope all my Hyderabad friends are safe. It's happening to see how, you know, these blasts are happening in India. <laughs> Why this happened? You know, because of these typing mistakes, which we do. And we don't realize most of the time. <laughs> so that is the reason. Lot of people make mistake, lot of people face problem when they are trying to input something, a form or something. So that is the reason we should have minimum text. Who does it help? It helps people who have motor disabilities, you know, paralysis or fracture or anything. I can't use both my hands. So I'm, you know, dependent on only one hand. So these kind of things. It also helps out of the context, outdoor context also. You're traveling, you, your one hand is busy, right? And people will not make mistakes like I did. And how do we achieve this? We can have alternate means to enter text. We can have voice recording and then, you know, uh, converting it to text for us, if it is possible. Because blind, they can't write. They might face problem. So these kind of things we can take care of, you know, pre-selected, drop-downs, and values and all. The next is using the semantic markup. So this is very important even for accessibility and not for accessibility also you should have a semantic code because it helps other developers also when they are working on your code. They won't find difficulties. But why do we need this? Why? Mm -hmm. So that the semantics of the pages um, is maintained. Like navigation should be in aside or nav tags and other links should be in aside. Header should be in header, footer should be in footer. Main content should be given with the role of main like that. 
yeah so basically it helps the screen readers right assistive technologies and disable uh, helps them as well so it's like you know if it is invalid it may not work properly in some of the screen readers or some of the devices and from the functional disability point of view assistive technologies cannot handle invalid markups so like you know if your markup is not valid if you haven't added doc types not html5 but the previous ones so ie may go into quirk mode in some of the cases the same thing holds true for uh, assistive technology so you should have a semantic code and then you know it is easier for them to navigate the blind users or people who are dependent on assistive technologies to navigate from one part to the other when you have a semantic code then how do we achieve that this is an example we have a form a well structured form which is having input which is also having label for which is a very important part of accessibility right android we basically use something called accessibility accessibility node provider so this is the entire you know uh, thing how we write a semantic code in android yeah and then we have uh, basically you know have a concise page content and size so i'll give you an example when i was working for one of the biggest airline i was developing their mobile application so uh they were actually you know arguing like they have a huge set of you know uh, terms and conditions which they wanted to put in mobile application right they they wanted to create a uh, native mobile application and they wanted to put the terms and conditions so i argued with them i said like why do you want that no one is going to read it on a mobile device and they were like no this is a policy we have to do it we can't do it anything so then it became very difficult for me to convince them and uh, finally i had to put because designers have limited choice they can just suggest but at the end you know what client tells that is what we have to do so later on what happened uh, people started facing lot of problems they were not able to read properly and you know scrolling 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 so they saw a lot of uh, drop off rate for the mobile applications the reason is because when you have so much of scrolling it's very difficult for people to read it it's very you you are almost lost and out of the context so that is the reason have limited context or make it look visibly you know uh, good so this also helps for accessibility for the functional disabilities people who have you know vision problem or screen magnifier who use a screen magnifier they can see only small parts at a time so they don't you know uh, you you won't uh, like the way we read something a book or something so we are engaged so we may not be so much engaged when we are using that on a mobile who does it help functional uh, i've told this right okay yeah now how do we achieve avoid scrolling if possible have one way scrolling don't have you know horizontal and vertical scrolling and then uh, create large clickable areas if possible rather than having lot of scrolling if you have lot of content structure it in a proper way so that you can they can read it properly now do not insert functions that can only be managed via gestures always add a button or link how many of you agree with this okay great very few people but why if you actually look at the example of google maps on android um, they have introduced a single finger gesture for zooming you know you double tap and then push your finger up or down the screen to zoom uh, which does not require two fingers anymore and that means you can do it with one your phone in one hand right. you don't need your other hand to use it mm -hmm. I, i think that's a great example of how to solve this problem you know earlier yeah. they had the zoom buttons yeah. and what they've done now is figured out how to do it with a single finger right that is one thing and most of the times i i realized this thing some of the times we don't even know what gestures to use like it's more of a guess work when i first started using my note i wasn't sure like okay if i pinch it will work if i zoom it will work or what tapping is one thing which i knew but half of the things was more experimental i started exploring and that is when i got so they are not intuitive you don't know what exactly it is right they are not intuitive and most of the uh, like users they don't recognize the gestures and plus blind users 
they can't uh, see these gestures or use these gestures. They are more dependent on uh, screen readers. Yeah, now who does it help? Uh, uh, sorry. Blind users, people with temporary disabilities, like if I have fracture, I am not able to use both my hands. Some of the gestures require both your hands kind of things. And then uh, for the functional it is, uh, for the situational it is like, you know, the context can be anything, indoor or outdoor, where you are you're not, uh, you are busy and you won't be able to use both your hands or some of the gestures you won't be able to understand. Okay, and the only thing is having buttons and text as an alternative and don't rely completely on gestures. Now, the last thing is ensure that it is possible to zoom the interface. How many people agree with this? You should have the possibility of zooming the interface. Okay, yeah. Very few. Yeah, so, so that is a mandate, right? You should, you should do it, zooming yeah. for everyone. I may be able to see things properly, you may be able to see things properly, what about the third person? True. Right? So there should be a possibility of zooming things. So you know, uh, my grandfather was playing uh, Sudoku on my iPad mm -hmm. and he's like 87 years old. He also read a lot of articles on my iPad. So uh, that's that's what I could relate to when you asked this question and uh, I was probably the first person to raise the hand. Yeah, definitely. It has so many people, not only like people who are aged or someone, but you know, also people like, uh, right, who have temporary disabilities or who have sight problems. So now, how can we do that in HTML? We have something called viewport and then you have to give the initial values, minimum, maximum. That is how you can do. But some of the browsers, they don't support this. So that again is a challenge. So that is the reason you should also have, you know, font size increasing kind of options like you, we do for uh, HTML and all. We have A plus, A plus plus and so on. So those kind of options is what we have to work on. Now, the only conclusion I want to draw with the entire guidelines, principles and my talk is mobile is for everyone. So think about it when you are designing your next application. Okay. So there are a couple of guidelines if you want to see. So uh, the mobile will be like uh, best practices, the accessibility guidelines and all. This is basically for the native uh, web, uh, mobile web applications and then we have something for the native applications, the platform specific uh, guidelines which we have. You can have a look and see what exactly it is. So I'm ready for the questions. Um, I have one here. here. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the um, contrast ratio, mm -hmm. um, can we compromise for the supplementary text? Uh, yeah, yeah, alternate text like supplementary text and yeah. all we can uh, exclude. There are a couple of exclusions, not all. Uh, uh, for examples like the gray text on the white, usually even for the HTML5 components where we have the placeholder text, icons coming up on the white background, mm -hmm. uh, which has a, the gray thing is like, gray color is always has a less contrast against the white background. Um, so I would say if your content is very much important, have the greatest contrast, but some of the things, the text which you feel is not so important and could be, you know, uh, skipped by the disabled also, in that case, have a minimal contrast. But just try to follow the 4 is to, 4 dot 5 is to 1 contrast minimum. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a question here. Let's see. So okay. my question is on the accessibility part of your talk. So see most of the companies at the time of the start or take the case of the startups, they are already involved in so m many issues. It's hard to include this uh, at the decision making level. But the, by, by the time you realize that you should consider this, say maybe one or two years down the line, it, uh, the cost 
rises up tremendously. So how do you create a fine balance? Yeah, so the uh, see, the main problem here is when I was talking about the decision making, how do you decide like I have to design this application? So when you're designing, you've already, you know, decided like I have to use HTML or I have to use CSS, sorry, uh, I have to use Objective-C or I have to use Java or whatever. You have already decided that thing. So what makes it so difficult for you to include accessibility? Accessibility is not, not something out of the blue what, which you are doing. Accessibility is basically you are trying to make your code more semantic, trying to add the labels and these kind of stuff which makes it more accessible, right? So talking about the colors, obviously you are going to design. So when you are designing, think about the accessibility part and do it, right? Yeah? Uh, Ma'am, I have a question. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, uh, so generally on your web websites, your, you have your alt text when your, the mouse hovers on say an image or something. Uh, how does that generally work on touch screen? Because we don't have that option of hovering over any, any element. Yeah, right? so basically in touch screens, uh, you don't have these alt text. I mean, this, this is basically, I'll tell you what exactly alt text is. Alt is basically alternate text. So alternate text is not basically like when I hover over the image, then I should see a tooltip. That is not what alt text is. Alt text is basically what if uh, your, you have a low bandwidth and you are not able to load the image. So till the time your image loads, you should see something rather than a blank space or you know something. So that is the reason you have an alternate text which tells you like okay this is the logo, right? The same way goes, uh, the same thing happens for the screen readers also and for the mobiles also. So if, if you don't have alt text, it will show you a blank space or you know a placeholder kind of thing but it will not tell you what exactly this image was which you may be curious for. That is why we use alt text. Yeah. So uh, this is not a question, this is uh, a follow-up comment to what Kiran asked like uh, there is absolute contrast say uh, white and black, uh, absolute contrasting text but then when you are reading uh, on white uh, uh, background, absolute black text would hurt your eyes. Subjectively, it might hurt uh, people's uh, eyes. It doesn't make for a very pleasant experience. So what I see on uh, a lot of websites, what they do is, instead of keeping it absolute black, they use a tone of dark gray or something, which, which is still acceptable contrast, but not doesn't hurt your eye. Yeah. Similarly, if you reverse uh, white text on black, it, uh, contrast is perfect but it doesn't make for a very pleasant uh, reading you, yeah. experience. And I'm sure uh, you've heard about uh, a site called uh, Contrast Rebellion. No, I haven't. Okay, uh, you should check Contrast that out. Rebellion. They make a case against uh, illegible text uh, just because some trends need to be followed, where text is like uh, just a, uh, a little darker version of the background. So mm -hmm. they make a very big case about it that uh, the text on the internet is supposed to be read. I mean, it's not just It's there. not supposed to be looked at, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that happens a lot in mock-ups, you know, it looks nice to have uh, low contrast in your mock-up because yeah. then it doesn't hurt your eyes with distracting details, but the details <laughs> are the text that you're reading it for. Correct, correct. Right. So, there is um, one more question, I'm sorry, I hope I got your name right. Uh, so, um, uh, one of the things I noticed in at least older browsers is that if you do not use anything if you use anything apart from absolute white and absolute black, mm -hmm. you lose subpixel hinting. Mm -hmm. uh, because most rendering engines were not capable of subpixel hinting in anything apart from black and white. Okay. You know, so black color text on white background or white text on black background. Um, I think that's been fixed in recent times, mm -hmm. but I don't know how universal that fixes. Okay. Okay. So if you use say hash two two two, which is a very common thing, Bootstrap does it, and so do a bunch of others. And if you look at um, HTML5 boilerplate, they use hash 444 as mm. the default text. Right, right. Now that thing disables a pixel hinting and you get just grayscale hinting okay. uh, in some browsers. Okay. So I, I don't know if any of you here are aware of what is the status of rendering text in browsers today. Uh, do they do subpixel hinting even with colored text? Uh, hi. Here. Yeah. Uh, is it. Uh, Possible to make native apps zoomable? Native apps? Zoomable. We, we zoomable, I, yeah. See, native application, it is very much easy because you are using the device's inbuilt capabilities. So you don't have to add some extra effort to do it. Because native applications already have these features. You don't have to do some extra coding or something for that. The only challenge is with the web applications. 
Uh, I have a question here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm I'm working on. Uh, we are uh, as a team. We are working on a enterprise web application, mm -hmm. which uh, caters users of all categories, and it is a crucial web application as it comes in the enterprise. And we have a search um, search uh, feature. Since we need to use a minimal uh, amount of components, so we are not we are actually neglecting a search button. Instead, uh, while pressing enter, it's it's by default everybody goes types a text and it has a placeholder text, types a text and press enter, um, it searches. But accessibility says that you need to have a but button for that. So what do you say of both this? How would you enter that in the mobile? Yeah, that is the challenge, right? So you should have some alternate way of doing it. So button. So that is the reason button is required, right? See, design looks good when you have all these fancy things, but is it accessible? Are people able to use it? Not only, I mean, disabled, talk about any functional uh, or situational kind of, you know, uh, problems which may arise. Then what? Yeah, uh, so uh, please take questions offline. It's time for lunch sure. now. Okay. So uh, please, uh, let's take a lunch break and then come back by 2.15 shortly.